Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Marcia Butler, the webinar director at Advice Chaser. Before we introduce our guests and get started, I need to do a bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars such as this one, featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own, and however true, funny, or interesting are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. We're thrilled to bring you today's educational presentation. Attendees are muted, but we do encourage you to ask questions using the chat box. The presenter will answer those queries during or after the webinar today as appropriate. If you ask a question in the chat box, go ahead and leave your phone number as well. And if we can't get your question during the event, we'll make sure someone reaches out to you after today's event. We want this experience to be as educational as possible, so please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. I'd love to introduce you to our presenter today. J.R. Greery is a certified financial planning practitioner that utilizes a unique approach and method methodology called financial life planning. Life planning connects the dots between our financial realities and the lives we long to live. This method is based on the premise that advisors should first discover a client's most essential goals in life before formulating a financial plan. So a client's finance, finances fully support those goals. As a lifelong learner, musician, and athlete, JR holds a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, trains Muay Thai, and has been playing the guitar for over 30 years. He actively performs and writes music in his band. And JR, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to you. We have talked a lot about this presentation. I think it's going to be a really fun one. So uh, I'm here for what you have to say. Sounds great. Hello, everyone. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is exponential growth in the world of investing. And I think the biggest um, words we use is compounding interest. And I wanted to take a, um, a dive into how compound interest works, how investing, how our money will grow over time. And then what we're going to do is talk about something called wealth eroding factors, things that you don't realize that attack our money along our investment journey that can hurt your finances. And so what we want to do is not only invest, but also defend against certain what we call wealth eroding factors that could really damage your finances over time. So next slide, yes. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is why it is so imperative to start saving money today, okay? So don't wait. Every day you wait could be thousands of dollars, tens of thousand dollars, or hundreds of thousands of dollars of mistakes. So we don't want to be that person. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put on the screen a calculator. The calculator helps us conceptualize how money flows over time. All right. So on the screen, you are going to see calculator. We call it the exponential curve calculator. So the way the calculator works is we have all this data I want to put into the screen. Okay, so present value means how much money I have today. We're going to assume that I'm a young, ripe 25 years old. I'm going to retire 40 years later at 65. And I'm going to make it to 85. Okay, now I am going to save 
every month, $833.33, odd number. But 12 months in a year times $833, that gives us $10,000 per year, assuming I earn 100 grand a year, give or take, that's 10% of my money I'm saving. And then over time, I'm going to earn 8% a year. Okay, now on the bottom here, we have this giant row of numbers. And I know everybody loves big giant rows and tables of numbers. So let's just follow along. In 2023, uh, I'm 25 years old. 2024, I'm 26. And we go all the way into the future. I'm 65 years old, the day in which I stop working. Okay, now I start out with zero. I add $10,000 and then I get profit of 8%. 8% plus my contribution is $10,800. And that repeats on January 1st of next year. This is December 30. Oh, EOY means end of year. BOY means beginning of year. So in the beginning of year two or age 26, 10,800 earns 10%. Uh, excuse me, I had $10,000. I get 8%. I'm at $22,464. And I keep this going on into the future. And I end up with $2.797 million. Not bad in my book. I am sure everybody's looking forward to this money. Almost $3 million. Okay. Now, now uh, just, just a, a quick question here. So I'm assuming that we're using these numbers because they're easy numbers to calculate. I don't know many 25-year-olds that make $100,000 a year yet. <laughs> right. And so we, yeah, we can change it. It doesn't, the numbers don't matter. They really don't. The, the concept is everything. So no intimidation factors, please. <laughs> don't be intimidated that, you know, you have to make a hundred grand a year. You can make millions of dollars only setting aside 300 bucks a month. So don't worry about it. And I could show that, but that, that's another subject. Therefore, how much have I put into the pie? I have contributed only $400,000 and I end up with $2.79 million, not bad. Okay, so this is called your exponential curve, okay? So on the left, I start off with, you can see $10,800 at the end of the year. And we go forward, moving forward into this scenario, and I have 2.79, the numbers are the same, 10,800 to 2.79 easy to understand. Okay, now here's the trick. This is the thing a lot of people don't understand about money. The slide said, please start today because you can miss out on a lot of money if you don't. <laughs> what you have to understand about investing is it's not so important what today is. What's more important is the day you're going to stop working. That's an important date because at some level, most of us will have to stop, whether it's fit due to phys physically we're required to, mentally we're required to, or we just want to enjoy the rest of our lives. Either one, there'll be a moment where you stop. Okay. So the end has, has meaning. If I start saving tomorrow instead of today, well, a year from now, let's just do a year from now. So the difference between $10,000 I would have had and the year number two, which is $22,000, is the difference of $12,000. And so theoretically, if you're like, they are, what is the big deal of $12,000 difference between year one and year two? Nothing. It's not a big deal. But that's not what happens. What happens is I'm more concerned about the end. And the end is $2.7 million. If you wait a year to save money, you end up with one year from the end, not from the beginning, which is $2.5 million. 2.8 minus 2.5, that's almost $300,000 you missed out on, not $12,000. You're giving up hundreds of thousands of dollars in mistakes of missed opportunity by not saving today. That's important. And that's sort of the overall arching theme we're going to talk about, you know, is that's a wealth eroding factor, the pausing, the holding on, the not investing right away. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> the next slide is the, um, 
um, conversation around principal interest and compound interest. So we hear these terms when we talk about investing. So principal is defined as the money that I contribute uh, every month or every year and over time. And in our example here, what was the principal? Well, the principal is I contributed $10,000 per year. And then I, on my screen here, what I can see is I've contributed $400,000 over that time frame. Therefore, that's my principal. The interest, and in this context, interest is the growth that, growth that I earn. So if I earn 8% times $10,000, that's $800 I earned in interest. Okay. Now, compounding interest is a powerful financial term where the interest that grows in my account also earns interest. So interest earning interest. And if you keep that repeat going on over and over and over again, what you end up with is this element of what I'm calling exponential growth. In the beginning, the growth is kind of small. And then all of a sudden, you see how we have this sort of like accumulation. This is the growth stage. Then it, it kind of like explodes and takes off. And then it, the, after that, it accelerates over time. And that's how we got to that concept of why it's so important to wait, um, to not wait, because the acceleration is you make almost at the end here from age 60 to 65, in five years, you make $800,000. That's pretty incredible. That's what compounding interest does. Um, so one of the most important factors in compound interest is time, time. And the, I often tell people this, it's unfortunate, but the most powerful tool you have in investing is your patience. So that's really important. So exponential growth. Compound interest eventually results in exponential growth. In our example, it takes about 30 years to get to the first million and only 10 years to get to the second million. All right, think about that. In the first um, 30 years, a $10,000, so you could see, I finally get to a million dollars around year 27, 28, right? Almost 30 years. It's a long time. And then in order to get to, two million dollars so here i am at age 52 year 28 52 eight years to get to the next million and then the next eight hundred thousand is five years after that so you can see how powerful time is and the later time frames are more powerful it's often why i get very um I'm very confident about the ebbs and flows in the market. And I saw a question come in about the rate of return on the market. We'll, we'll touch on that sort of towards the end, if you don't mind. But generally speaking, I am, I'm not afraid of seeing stock markets drop. I am not afraid of this ebb and flow of the market if I know I'm going to be in this game for a long time. And you should be. Um, you should be in the game for a long time. That's what it's for. I mean, think about it. What is, what is the stock market? The stock market is a place to own a business. So if I was going to go own a business, in the first year, the last thing I'd be thinking about is selling the business in a year, right? What we want to do is own the business for 20, 30, 40 years. And every year, I keep receiving money. The more money I receive from the business, the happier I am. And the growth of those dollars every year. That is the concept called dividends. That's for another call. But as you own stocks, it doesn't matter what the growth is of that value of the company. While you're in it, enjoy the dividends. And what, if, what you can do, which is another concept of compound interest, is reinvest the dividends. All right. So if you don't mind, Marche, can you go back to the risk factor? Okay, what other factors influence the growth? So this is the not so fun part of the conversation, but I have to do this to you because I want everyone to be aware of reality. All right, so reality is known as the outside world and my fancy calculator is known as the inside world. The inside world is like the person said, uh, I earn 8% every year 
perfectly throughout time. That is nonsense, okay? That's not how these things work. So we have to monitor um, factors that can hurt our growth over time. Taxes, inflation, the risks and up and downs of the market, fees, and consumer risk. So I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about on the screen here. And so in the perfect world, we get this green line going up to the top into the future, okay? But that's not reality. Reality is what I call the outside world of reality. Okay, so what happens to my dollars if I start adding in the outside world of realities? So first thing is, let's assume that I pay capital gains on this investment account. That is 15% in today's current world. Well, just because I pay taxes every year, and if I paid those taxes from the account, right, not from an outside account, but inside the account, I have lost almost $700,000. So minimizing taxes is a very important thing. Now, there's all kinds of strategies. Today is not a tax-saving strategy conversation. We can do that on another day. But for now, understand that that's the effect it has. Okay. Oh, inflation. Have we heard enough about inflation? Is it ever going to end? No, it's never going to end, unfortunately. So how do we... Now, I can, like, what I can do is I can show what happens if I have inflation, okay, what was the inflation in year 2%, 2%, 3%, 4%, 6%. I can do all that. For today, let's just do one easy number. All right. So the average inflation is a little bit over two. Okay. Some will argue it's at three or a little bit higher than three. Today's inflation, they say, is six. And a few months ago, it was eight. Right. So it's all over the place. It could be anything. Let's just do three. If anyone, don't get mad at me. I'm just doing 3% inflation. Okay. Now. When I change this future dollars to today's dollars, what's going to happen is my money is going to lose value. If I have inflation, the reality of those dollars in the future is now $620,000 because everything gets expensive. And so my money is not worth as much money in the future because everything got that much more expensive. To have $2 million or $2.7 million in the future means I really only have $620,000 then. Whoa, that's not good. All right, it gets worse. All right, so what happens if I have volatility? That's what this person was talking about. What happens if I get the ebbs and flows? It's not this beautiful straight line anymore. I get these downloads that I have to deal with. And if you take a loss by getting out, at bad timing, this could be even worse. I can reflect that right here, but I don't want to get too crazy. Now I can get different rates of return here. So I can change the year and I get a different, I get different mountains, right? And different outcomes, right? That, that's not what's important. Like it doesn't matter which one I use, but you can see I get these different changes. Okay. Unfortunately, most people on this call will never invest the dollars themselves. They will bring on some sort of team. You hear about the 1% annual asset management. You can have an annual fee you pay your advisor. If you're gonna use the account to pay the advisor, it will come from there. There's all kinds of fees that go on. There's transaction fees that you don't know about. There's expense ratios in your mutual funds and your ETFs. There's all kinds of fees. For today, I can just use 1% and uh-oh, my money drops. Hmm. So lifestyle, you could start spending the money on your lifestyle instead of reinvesting your dollars. We can make those like something that could attack your money. I don't know, you could argue that we don't need to put that in there. All right, if you have to replace things in your life, everybody's got to replace the fridge and the thing and the freezer and all that stuff when they break or the roof. If you get the money from the account, that's where it's coming from. So you lose that money. You have to take money out. People get sued in our society. People get lose money through the theft. There's all kinds of craziness that can happen. I'm not going to reflect those because they're just too nuanced and too out there. But you can see that, um, man, I went from having $2.8 million 
in my life when in reality I only have $667,000. This is why you have to monitor um, wealth eroding factors in your future. Okay, we're not done yet. So what if you started saving later? We already discussed this, right? I just wanna show you from a different perspective. Now we have all these factors involved, right? And if I wait five years to really start saving, oh, that was a good one. Ah, look at that. Oh no, I'm sorry, here it is. So um, yeah, these things have an effect on our finances. The later you start, the more or less money you get. Okay, moving on. Now we have a conversation about retirement. And retirement means I got to spend my money over time. All right. And so in my example here, if I just eat, if I have $4 million in the future, how much money can I spend so that I don't run out of money? Right. And people are going $4 million. That's amazing. I mean, how much money I could spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, right? Well, not really. If you had $3 million or two point whatever million dollars in the future, it only means $94,000 a year and you'll die with nothing left in reality. $94,000 on, on two something million, that's not a lot of money. So we have to analyze like how does retirement play into these numbers. All right, let's go back to the slideshow, please. There's a lot in there. And this is a lot for some human brains to consider, but um, I want people to understand there's more to this than just, than just, you know, putting your money away and hoping for the best. There's no hope for the best in financial planning. We have to put real um, thought into this. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I love this. So we have some ideas that can mitigate the mistakes we make financially. The first one, auto draft. I love this. This is one of the most powerful financial tools we have. The ability to automate money leaving my checking or savings account and going into some investment tool. The reason why everybody in society has a 401k plan, I promise you, is because they take the money out before you get a chance to spend it. That's why 401ks work. Same thing with health insurance. Most people's health insurance comes out from their paycheck. The reason why they have health insurance, because it's automated. I can imagine if they stop automating health insurance, half the, half the country wouldn't have it because they would just spend the money on something else. Okay, cash flow, budgeting. This is powerful stuff. This, it is, now at this point in society, you don't have an excuse not to budget. The reason why is there are financial products out there for free. They're all free. That will do this stuff automatically for you. I mean, you have to attach, you know, the data feed, which is like, you know, you put your credit card information into these programs. They're safe, they're effective, and they like literally help you manage your cash flow. Um, and like start putting money into things automatically now that you know what you can save. Okay, increase your income. This is huge. This is, people have no idea that they can invest in themselves. I talk about this all the time. You can invest in yourself and increase your income. The more money you make, the more money you can set aside. The big, one of, a wealth eroding factor that, I, that people don't know is as you make more money, you will tend to spend more money. Well, as you make more money, you could also save more money. That's a way of getting around that wealth earning factor. And of course, an advisor. Advisors will do a couple things for you. The first thing an advisor do is your, they can be a coach. They can be your accountability buddy. That's it. That, that's worth its weight in gold. Because when someone holds you accountable to doing the things you said you're going to do, the most likely, the probability of you achieving that goal goes up. It's a psych exercise. If someone's staring at you, making sure you exercise, you're going to do it, right? If someone's staring at making you eat right, you're going to do it. Same thing with money. If you, someone's following you around, making sure you do it right, you're going to do it. And then, of course, an advisor through knowledge and education will teach you how to avoid making these wealth eroding factor mistakes. Okay, next slide. 
final thoughts. This is, I guess, the time, Marcia, we do some questions. Absolutely. So here are some some questions. I don't know that you addressed that one about eight uh, percent on in our example being pretty high. Can you talk about um, how how like what rate that advisors will kind of assume as far as um, rate of return and you know what's safe and what's not not safe as far as predicting or not predicting, I guess, uh, planning for the future. Yeah, so um, rate of return. The question was getting 8% today seems unrealistic. And uh, I know where that's coming from, right? It seems like that will be very challenging. Uh, if I go back 20 years, let's see here. 20 years brings me back to 2002, right, 2003. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot harder to achieve 8%. Okay, so most financial planning uh, software programs, okay, they will assume much lower than 8% on your expectation for your future growth and future rate. Um, the reason why I used 8% is because if you ask anyone on the street, how much does the stock market make over 20 long periods of time, they'll tell you seven to 10. <laughs> and, so, and so there's some truth in that. If you do a mathematical calculation of what happened over any given 20 year period, on average, you'll find that it did fall in between the seven to 10% range. Right, but the reality is, um, it doesn't kind of, it doesn't flow like that due to, um, due to, uh, uh, yeah, the, the ebbs and flows of the markets. Right. So, uh, hold on, let me give you some good data here. Hold on one second. I want to just take a look. I have a calculator that shows me the average. That's rate okay. Sometime. Now, well, tell see. people that. If you're interested in putting in more questions in the chat, we're able to take those now. We have some more coming up. But I want to make sure everyone knows they can put questions in the chat. Yeah, I went back to 2001 till today. It made 9%. 2002 was 11% if you started on 2002. This is the S&P 500. Uh, 2003, 11%. So, I mean, it's there. It's in the, it's in the numbers. I just moving forward, do, can we expect it? I mean, I don't know. That, that's hard. I mean, one of the things I tell people is, you know, when, when I think about the future of our society, I, I think about is our institutions, the big companies, are they still like, trying to grow the bottom line? Are they still trying to invent? Are they still trying to be creative? Are they still trying to lower costs? I mean, it seems like we keep doing that over and over again. We keep growing technologically advanced and innovation. There's no reason for me to believe that we're, we're going to stop that process. And so companies are still growing. We, you know, if we change the whole dynamic of our entire financial system, then we have a, now it's a different conversation, but yeah, eight percent seems. I see what you mean by high, but um, yeah, you never know. And so that's the thing: you don't know what the future beholds. You have to have a plan to deal with what happens if it doesn't do that. That's part of financial planning. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, um, you talked about minimizing taxes, and uh, can you? And we have that fifteen percent as on our example. Can you tell us a little more about like some of the strategies that you do to minimize taxes? Uh, the first one, well, there's two kinds of tax, right? So there's my income tax, there's my um, capital gains tax, okay? And then there's uh, my retirement taxes, right? So income tax during the year is, you know, people who, we live in an age where starting a business or a side hustle is one of the most 
easiest things to do. And if you work for a company and earn what we call a W-2, and then all of a sudden you create a side business, you can now avoid taxes by shifting your in, some income over to your business. Let the business generate. And businesses, what they do is they have deductions that they're able to utilize. If you work for a company and you're W-2, you don't get deductions. There's no So that's one strategy. Number two, in the investment world, we have something called tax loss harvesting. Tax loss harvesting is a concept in investments where you will take a loss on your account in a year, use that loss as a deduction against your taxes, and then instantaneously buy something that is similar, not identical, but similar, and without breaking any rules, there's a way to do this. And then you um, use those tax strategies to save you tax money over time. You can save as much as one to 3% per year on average in gains, or you can save the losses uh, by making those kinds of things. There was a research report by Vanguard, believe it or not, on tax loss harvesting. And it could be as much as you earn one to 3% in like profitability by tax loss harvesting. The next thing you can do is use financial products strategically. For instance, if you put money into a Roth, that will, in retirement, reduce your taxable income. There's certain insurance products that you can utilize to um, lower your tax bill in the future. Real estate is a powerful financial tool that can, you can utilize for tax savings. So, I mean, we can go down the rabbit hole of tax savings, but I'm not a CPA. Uh, I understand the future outcome of decisions that you make with your taxes. But um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that, that you want to do is um, uh, those kinds of tax strategies. All right. Here's another question. In your example, you said that this person re retired at 65. If they started saving for retirement later, does it make sense for them to delay their retirement age? Yeah, the, well, the answer, of course, yes. That's a, that's the simple answer is yes. Uh, you don't have to, but if you if you if you don't, what you so what happens is this: the the amount of money. It's all about how much money you can spend safely between now and the next thirty years of your life, right? If you're, let's say, you retire at sixty, we have to make an assumption, right? The assumption is I'm going to live thirty years in this retirement day, right? So I'm sixty five. I leave the planet at 95 years old, right? And so for that 30 year time frame, based on how much money I have and all the different buckets of money that I have, how much can I spend safely? If you don't like the answer, right? And let's say the answer is you can only spend $40,000 a year safely and you need $50,000 a year safely, don't retire that year, wait another year because it's one year less that you have to survive on these funds as time goes on. Now, we, we've done a presentation on this already. Uh, the sequence of returns was presentation, retirement income. So there's a, we did as a team, a presentation on money in retirement. So if you want to, you know, advise, uh, Marcia, send them to where that, that, that yeah, is. if you type in, uh, go to, go to our webinars on advicechaser.com and you can type in, um, I'll, I'll find it and, and tell you, but if you type in, uh, JR's name, you should come up with all the webinars that we've done. Yeah. So yeah, I would definitely delay, uh, is, a, you don't have to delay. Um, and then there's strategies you can use to actually not have to delay your retirement, but, um, it does come up from time to time. Not only that, I mean, like you could, but here's another thing you could do. You could adjust your income in retirement too. Like one year, spend a lot of money. One year, don't spend as much, you know, one year, spend a lot of money. One year, don't spend as much based on what's going on in the environment around you, right? You could also get away with retirement with certain products, right? Like um, social security delays and annuities are like things that guarantee you income no matter what. So you, you know, you can feel comfortable with those uh, products as well. There's so much that in that question. <laughs> a lot yeah, that, that is. All right, this is a question I'm, I, we got in. How do we invest in ourselves to become our own lender? Ooh, Any advice for instruments we can invest in and borrow from paying interest back to ourselves? Yes. Wow. We have an advanced uh, person here. So, yes, 
What you want to do eventually, and the key word is eventually, you want to be your own bank, right? You want to build up your uh, income streams and, and financial snapshot to emulate being your own bank and being your own lender. And not like the bank we heard about in the news today, okay? That's not the stuff we're doing, okay? <laughs> but what we're doing is, what happens is over time, a really strategic person who really takes time to build wealth will start saving money per month, right? We set aside dollars. But what you wouldn't do is put all your money into one basket. You would diversify where that money goes. Okay, now you can put money in a checking account, right? And so you just have money in a savings account you could use a stock and bond portfolio, not your retirement account, but an outside stock and bond portfolio. You can use real estate and build up real estate. You can use the cash value of life insurance policies. Many of these things you're allowed to borrow against. You can borrow against the cash value of a life insurance policy. You can borrow against the equity of your home, or you can borrow against the equity of an investment property. And then you can borrow against your uh, investment stock bond portfolio. Many institutions allow you to do that. Now, when you borrow the money, don't go buy a Ferrari, okay? Because you're going to lose money on that deal. What you should buy is more assets that do the same thing, right? You can get more real estate. You can use that money to invest in a business. You can use that money to invest. You can use money to invest in the stock market again, again from something that the stock market has gone down. Right. And remember, you're going to get dividends from that. If you buy real estate, you're going to get rental income. If you buy more insurance products, you get more dividends from the insurance products. So you start receiving rewards from borrowing against your own existing self or your own existing assets. That is how you, um, that is how, that's called the like the velocity of money multiplying, right? You're, mul you're, you're speeding up the rate at which your money will grow over time. That is powerful stuff. It can be done. It requires lots of effort, lots of time, lots of thinking, but it starts out with simply saving money every month in your budget. So yeah, great question. Excellent question. Well, that's all the time we have for uh, our questions. Do you have any final thoughts you want to uh, leave us with about exponential growth? Me? No. Uh, yeah. I think we covered everything. We went over a lot of stuff. There was some complicated stuff in there. Um, I think that, you know, getting to work right away on saving money is imperative. Uh, I believe that, you know, this wasn't a topic about just investing in the stock market. I don't want it to come across like that. It's just the stock market's an easy tool to, to, to discuss because we all use it in our retirement plans, right? So there's all kinds of things out there you can invest your dollars into. Uh, like, you know, as Marche says, Mar Marche and Advice Chaser says, you got to talk to a professional. They're really helpful. And there's, um, you don't want to make mistakes. Mistakes are costly. Um, and um, yeah, you all can do it. Everybody can make a lot of money. Keyword is, as I said before in the conversation, patience, have patience. You're going <laughs> to need it. It's boring. Making a lot of money is boring. It's slow and boring. I promise. Folks, uh, thank you so much for being here. We want to thank JR for, for being here and for the organizations that have worked to bring you this webinar today. Look for an email soon with a link to the replay of this event, and you're welcome to share that replay with your friends and family. Here at Advice Chaser, we're all about helping you find a financial advisor who is a great fit for your life and your financial questions. Our matching service is free to you and every one of our advisor partners has committed to offer a free initial consultation to anyone we introduce them to. Find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Once again, from Advice Chaser, thank you so much for coming and we'll see you at another webinar soon. Goodbye, everyone.